Let's take a look now at example four. This is our last example in this section. And the purpose of it is to really kind of show why we actually care about things like discrete distributions. What's really the purpose of this and how does this relate to the real world? So take a look at what we have here. A customer for a home insurance policy owns a $200,000 home. Let's suppose that there's a probability of 0.1%, so not 1%, less than 1%, that the home will be totally destroyed by fire. And the probability is 0.5%, or half of a percent, that the home will suffer a 50% loss due to fire. And let's, for the sake of argument, ignore all other partial losses. We'll really oversimplify the world here and say it either the house either completely burns down, halfway burns down, or I guess really nothing happens at all. Now, I'm going to be interested in here in thinking about how much money this insurance company might actually have to pay the customer in a particular tragedy. So I'm going to go ahead and define my variable with that in mind. So defining a variable here, I would do something like say, let x represent the amount of money the insurance company has to pay the customer. Now, we can kind of see that immediately there's a lot of different amounts of money that the insurance company might have to pay. Remember, the whole goal of insurance, right, is that you pay into them, right? You pay them, uh, you know, maybe a monthly or biannually, you pay them some sort of a fee. And then if a tragedy actually does happen to you, like your house burns down, they give you a whole bunch of money so that way you can try to replace some stuff. But the insurance company might ultimately want to know, well, how often do I realistically expect to have to pay people? That might be very important to know, right? Because if I have to pay people tens of thousands of dollars all the time, I might go bankrupt as an insurance company very, very quickly. So I'm going to go ahead and start to at least create a probability distribution here for all the different amounts of money, X, that the insurance company might have to pay to the customer, and then we'll try to find their associated probabilities. Okay, well, let's see here. We already can tell that one amount that the insurance company might have to pay is going to be, well, I guess you could say, how about zero dollars? That's probably almost the most common occurrence. Most of the time, your insurance company pays you nothing. Think about it the same way with car insurance. You pay car insurance all the time, but how often do you actually get a check back or something like that from your insurance company? Well, like hardly ever. You're pretty much paying them because most of the time you're not getting in an accident. So here I have zero dollars as a possible value of X. Now, if there's a fire to the house, then the insurance company might have to pay out. Notice if the house burns halfway down, I could probably state that the insurance company would give me about half of the value of the house, which is about $100,000. But the insurance company might also give me $200,000 if the house burned completely down. So notice I do have a discrete variable here. I'm getting paid one of these three amounts. Now, I know the probabilities for a couple of these. For the halfway destroyed by fire, there's a half percent chance. Notice that if I went to this, this would be 1%. So I want to go even lower, and I want to go down here. This would be half of a percent chance. $200,000 was a 0.1% chance. So that would look like this. And if I know that all my probabilities have to add up to be 1, then I can probably guess over here that the chances that they pay me nothing is point, what, 994? Like a 99.4% chance that they pay nothing. But still, I can see that even though the house burning totally down, or burning completely to the ground by fire is very rare, if it ever does happen, this insurance company is going to have to fork out a lot of money. So they might want to be ready. Notice I could also take this information oops, and turn it into a uh, probability histogram. Now, this probability histogram is kind of silly because if I look at my associated probabilities, if up here is 100%, then down here would be 50%, 
down here would maybe be 25%. This would be like 12 and a half percent. I'm just constantly cutting this in half. And so I can see that if I was to shape up here my different bars, so let's have this be 100K, let's have this be 200K, and I started to kind of create these bars, I can see at zero, I'm gonna have a bar that's pretty much completely maxed out, looking something like this. At 100K, I'm only gonna get a half a percent. That's I don't, like, gonna be barely even on the picture, right? It's gonna be like this. And then for 200K, I need to get something even smaller, I don't know, like, like this, like barely off the page. It's a very lopsided distribution. This happen, the payment out of zero happens unbelievably more frequently. But notice I can still then go ahead and ask some basic probability questions that the company might be interested in knowing. Like, what is the probability that the insurance company has to pay the customer some amount of money? Well, if I look at what I have up here, that would be the chances that X is going to be greater than or equal to $100,000, right? Because those are really the only options for paying out. And I can see very quickly that's going to be my 0.005 plus 0 0.001 or 0 0.006. That is like 0.6%. Okay, so it's still a very low chance that the insurance company has to pay something. But here's an interesting one. What if a fire definitely occurred and the insurance company definitely has to fork out some money to the customer? What are the chances that the amount would be $100,000? Well, let's see. Notice this is a conditional probability. The question is, if I know that the house is already on fire, what are the, or already burned down, or uh, the customer is going to have to get paid, what are the chances of paying 100,000 given that I know I'm definitely going to have to be paying something? Here's paying something, $100,000 or more, and here's the exact outcome that I want. Notice that, again, this is really easy to try to go ahead and determine by using just my conditional probability formula. So I would say I want to find all x's in the table that are $100,000 and at the same time are greater than or equal to $100,000. In the denominator, I just need to know the probability that x is greater than $100,000. Well, notice that, again, we already have the denominator at 0 0.006, and the numerator is super easy to find. Because if I look at my table, what are the only x's that are exactly 100,000 and also greater than or equal to 100,000? Well, that's just 100,000 itself. So the top here would be 0 0.005. So if I crunch this out on a calculator, I'm going to get a probability that looks like this. So given that the house burns down, the chances that the insurance company is going to have to pay the only the $100,000 amount is pretty good, right? Like 83% of the time, that's what they end up having to pay. But here's a very important question. What amount of money should the insurance company expect to pay? each customer they have. So, hmm. Now, because not every customer's house is going to burn down, right? So most of the time you're paying zero dollars. But every so often you got to pay somebody $200,000. So what would it look like if we kind of averaged out that amount of money that we might have to spend across all of the customers at the company? Well, notice here that when we're saying that we want to figure out what we expect to pay, remember that we associate that word expect with average. We want to find the average for x. Well, let's go to the calculator so we can type in our table and then actually calculate our average and finish answering these questions. All right, now that I'm at the calculator, I can go ahead, click my stat button, Start typing things in in here. So I have my zero, my 100,000, my 200,000, and there are probabilities over on the other side. So 0 0.994, 0 0.005, 0 0.001. Remember, I'm going to click on my stat button, go to calculate, do one var stats with my list one and my list two. 
hit calculate. So I get an average of $700. Okay, so if I was to go here, I would say that I would expect to pay a customer $700. That's kind of what it averages out to be. So like once a payout hits, you could imagine if you had to distribute that money to every single customer, that would just come out to be about $700 a customer. So here's the interesting thing. What then should the price of the insurance premium be for a policy, right? Like maybe the insurance company would want to use this information to figure out how much money to charge for things. If they know that on average, they're going to have to pay out $700, say a year to every single customer, then what should the insurance premium be so the insurance company can break even? Or how much should they charge to be profitable? Well, these are actually very simple questions. To break even, they should charge $700, right? If they collect $700 from every single person ahead of time, and then say at the end of the year, they've had to now pay out roughly $700 per person, they should have enough money to cover all of their costs. And of course, to make a profit, to make profit, they should charge, well, I guess anything over $700. Okay, well, that makes a lot of sense. And companies actually use this exact set of ideas to help make decisions. Probabilities are very, very important tools um, to be able to help us make informed choices about how to navigate in the world. So hopefully this gives you a little bit of an idea of how to actually um, imagine the use of these different uh, distri or this distribution for discrete variables. And I would encourage you to go take a look at the worksheets where you can find some other examples of scenarios similar to this, where you can again try to make these decisions about how you would actually use probabilities to uh, advance in the world and try to make some real world decisions based on the numbers that we're now able to calculate. In the next section, we'll take a look at the next column over on the formula sheet and begin to talk about what we call a binomial distribution.